happened in, in the Vietnam War, married in some cases several times, appreciate titles and perks, never had, times to, never had the time to smell the roses, but they want to do that now. So those are very different descriptions, right? So for us as providers talking about HIV and aging, we were like, wow, this is really changes our perspective on how we approach this topic. Maybe the baby boomers might be more open to talking about things. I remember I always use this example because always, it always stuck with me. This is from maybe six, seven years ago. We were doing a training in Harlem at a senior center. And the providers there were like, why are you talking about sex here? The director invited us to come there. But the, mm -hmm. other, the other folks that were there that were working there were like, don't, don't talk about this. Like, this is really uncomfortable. Don't, don't go there. And then, you know, we got there and we're like, we're here, we're going to talk about something, you know, we have to talk about this. So uh, there was a, a lady there that said, I may be old, but I ain't cold. Like, <laughs> I, I want to talk about this, but there was just never like an opportunity for people to, to talk about it. So that was, that always stuck with me because it's always the providers, it's us that are uncomfortable. We assume that they don't want to talk about it or that, you know, it's taboo, like what you said. And for some people it is taboo. Maybe some of those folks that were in those older groups, maybe, and maybe I'm making assumptions there too. Um, but yeah, a lot of times it's the providers that don't want to talk about it. So it's up to us to kind of get over that feeling of discomfort so that we can have those uncomfortable conversations. So we can ask, ask about sexual histories so that we can do testing for people that are over 50, 60, 70 um, when they're at risk rather than missing that altogether. And then people end up uh, with co-occurring illnesses and all sorts of like, um, you know, getting an AIDS diagnosis early, which we'll talk, we'll talk more about as we go along. Yes. Boomers are the major that's what it, yeah, that was the description that they gave us, the me generation. I'm sure that's too, yeah. I, th you know, when I read that, I was like, me generation, but yeah, that's, that's the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the case. See, and the thing is, not everybody, you know, is under each one. Um, okay, so let's look at this one. I think it's working, so back to the remotes. The HIV infection rate among older adults has remained steady over time. Do you agree with that, disagree? if you have an answer please do and you don't even have to point it it will it will pick it up okay Most people disagree then, either strongly or just disagree. And so those people are right. It has not remained steady over time. That's, that's yeah, absolutely. So 1995, this is what the AIDS cases over 50 looked like. 2005, just 10 years later, that's what it looked like. And that's when we started doing ROA, because we were like, wow, you know, we could see these numbers like this. But then we know that nobody's talking about this issue because it's only about young people for whatever reason. Um, and so this is actually what really preempted all of the work that we started doing, from the research onto all the trainings nationally, statewide, and all, all of the stuff that we were doing. So it has not remained steady over time. It has been growing. It continues to grow. And we should expect that as people are aging. But the idea is to make sure that people are living uh, healthier lives, have better quality of life. That's something that we really focus on, that secondary prevention piece. Um, and then also, we want to focus on primary prevention, too, because people are getting infected as they're older. So we don't want to abandon that concept altogether, as we often skip over that. Okay, so I think we did talk about this a little bit. So 1996, protease inhibitors came around. Um, does this thing have a laser on it? No? Yes, okay, perfect. All right, so we see here living with HIV infection the numbers were going up from 1981, this goes to 2007, and it continues to rise since 2007. So that's going up, people living with HIV. And it was rising, the number of deaths were also happening uh, at high rates up until 1995, 19, 1996, when protease inhibitors came around. But then there was a significant <coughs> drop off because those medications were so successful, yet we have people that continue to live with HIV that are aging and getting older. So that's basically what this is, um, is stating. Uh, and so we talked a, just a second ago about concurrent diagnoses. So concurrent diagnoses, what, what does that refer to? Uh, anybody else? Co-infections, co we'll talk a little bit about that. Go ahead. 
Absolutely. That's that's what this refers to. Concurrent diagnosis means, you know, these are usually folks that might be, um, you know, feeling sick because of some reason, they go in because of that reason, end up getting tested for HIV, get a positive result, and get an AIDS diagnosis at the same time. So when that happens, what does that typically mean? Why would someone get a concurrent diagnosis? They weren't getting tested. What's that? They weren't getting tested. They weren't getting tested. So they probably were living with HIV for a long time, didn't know their status, and then ended up getting an AIDS diagnosis, right? And that happens just because of all the things we've been talking about. We don't talk about it. Right? We don't have the conversation that's uncomfortable. And so people end up living with HIV and don't even know it. And so when we look at the age breakdown, the small blue one is 13 to 24, and it goes all the way up to 55 and up. But we see that the, the bar grows each, at each age group. So as we get older, we're more likely to have a concurrent diagnosis. That's, that's the idea here. Um, and so this really is our cue to make sure that we're doing uh, you know, testing events specifically for people over 50. That's something that we've been doing in New York with our city council project um, for the past several years, where we target older people specifically. Is there something that exists here like that, where people over 50 are targeted for testing? What do those look like, those targeted events? Like how, so, how do they differ from a, a regular So there are materials that are usually developed that, you know, like for instance, the, what, some of the things that I showed, but they're not developed by us. They're developed by folks that we work with. Um, that say, you know, you need to get tested. Did you get tested for, in fact, I'll show you as we get, go along here, but did you get your mammogram screening? Did you do, you know, your glucose test or, you know, whatever? Did you do your other test? Did you do your HIV test? And so we're kind of including that in the whole, you know, everything else that you're getting tested for, this should be included as well. Um, and so uh, there are certain um, neighborhoods or certain areas where people are recruited from or, you know, clients that, you know, go to the senior center, we might do it at the senior center. If we do a training at the senior center, we'll have a van that's there that day. Um, there are many, like at, at different um, health fairs, we'll have an area that specifically people over 50 will invite people over 50 to be tested. And also through social media and things through Facebook there. Yeah. Um, given that the CDC is recommending um, HCV testing for anybody, yes. for all boomers, are they linking those two and saying are you using HCV? I HCV? haven't seen a lot of that, but that's a conversation we started having last year because mm -hmm. that's, that's an excellent gateway to get people in because boomers are being tested for HCV, so those folks should also be tested for HIV as well. So we started doing that last year. Um, I don't know as far as CDC recommendations. There hasn't been any sort of, you know, that, that hasn't been the case. Yeah. In fact, CDC says 13 to 64 is when you should get tested. But what <laughs> happens after 64, you shouldn't be tested anymore. And so that's been kind of one of the contentions that we've had for many years. Like, what is that? What are you saying? Implicitly, you're saying something there yeah. by saying 64 is the cutoff. Um, so yeah, but that's a really good point. I think that's, that's actually useful for anybody that really wants to do kind of targeting older folks. If you're getting tested for HCV already, why not do H HIV as well? And we know the reason for that because hepatitis C, the rates for the prevalence of hepatitis C among baby boomers is extremely high. Okay, all right. So I mentioned I was gonna just give you some background information here about some of the places where we work, uh, where the prevalence is highest. New York City is the epicenter just because the population is the highest. Uh, throughout the country. So this is as of 2013, but we're above 50% now uh, of people with HIV are over 50, 77 over age 40, 77% over age 40. So I don't think there's any argument to be made that this doesn't affect older people. So I hope that idea is kind of slowly fizzling out. DC, 42% over 50, 73% over 40, and these are a bit older. Uh, so have you guys seen this, AIDS cases in California? This is from your surveillance data. Um, so, yeah, you can see Southern California here where the darkest areas are, where the prevalence is highest. And this is really, really, really tiny. But when you look at the top 10 AIDS counties, Los Angeles is number one, which I'm sure you're well aware of. San Francisco is just below that, San Diego, and then others. So those are the top three. So San Francisco is actually up to 58% now, over 50 uh, which really prompted a lot of the work that we did there, why, we, why I went there two, two years ago and why we started doing a lot of the capacity building work there. Um, but I would say San Francisco is a, ahead of the game in a lot of ways because they have a lot, it's a very resource rich environment. A lot of um, you know, support is available for folks and they're well aware of this. They have an HIV and aging work group under the government you know, that meets monthly. And so we were attending, I was attending that meeting every month talking about ways to provide services that make sense for older folks. So 
I don't think that exists anywhere else throughout the country. It doesn't exist in New York. Um, I don't think it exists here, um, but it's something that needs to be considered moving forward. Um, so Alameda County is another place that we were uh, doing this work as well. 52% over 50, 78% over 40. So you see a trend, right? This is something that's happening everywhere. Um, and it's not just something that's going on in LA. So this is the, the checklist that I was telling you about. This was actually used for some of our older adult testing um, that you were asking about, Phil. Uh, so yeah, did you do your prostate exam, blood pressure, diabetes screen? Did you do your HIV test? So that's what we're trying to highlight here. And we had uh, different cards that were targeting different groups with different faces and everything. So they were used in different communities. And this was probably the most well-received uh, you know, literature that we developed, I think, this checklist one. Uh, so yeah. And we've got it in English, Spanish, English and Spanish for sure. And that brings us to LA. So 45% over 50, 74% over 40. So it's no, no different. I mean, we're right here at that, at that trend here in LA too. Um, so I took some information from, uh, you should have the handout in front of you. It's just a, uh, a two-sided, one-page document. Uh, that came from the comprehensive plan that was developed very recently. Was anybody here part of that group that was developing that, that comprehensive plan? So there's a 2017 to 2021, this is part of the HIV plan, and they had a section on HIV and older adults, which is great, because a lot of them don't consider that. Um, I was part of the one in Alameda County in, in Oakland just uh, last year, and we were having a lot of conversations around aging too, because that really was never part of the comprehensive HIV plan ever. So this is great, and there's a lot of really good information in that handout, so I hope you take a look at it. I extracted some of it for this. Um, so older people make up 30% of Los Angeles' general population, yet they represent 45% of all people living with HIV. So that shows you a disproportionate uh, percentage there. So older adults tend to have lower rates of viral suppression than younger adults <coughs> in LA County. Is that true or is that false? And I'll ask you to answer on your, on your remote control. Can you guys still hear me? Am I fading? Okay, <laughs> I can't tell. True or false? We're doing a true or false question. Wow, okay, so that's really, so the answer here, older adults tend to have lower rates of viral suppression, is false. So when we look here, have you guys seen this care continuum for LA? Okay, I hope this is a most up-to-date one. This is from 2013, I'm, I, I think it is. Oh, they did, okay. Ah, okay, all right, so it might be actually higher, hopefully. Okay, all right. Oh, so then. Oh, that's significantly higher than even what's yeah. here. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, it, how many people are familiar with the HIV care continuum and how that works? Okay. All right. Maybe let me just describe it just a little bit then. Uh, okay. So, the care continuum basically is the goal here is that we want to get people virally suppressed. When we get people with a zero, with a, who are virally suppressed, a zero viral load, uh, that means that they're less likely to in infect other people and we can keep the, the HIV incidence low, right? So we'll have fewer new infections. Um, and also because quality of life is better when you're virally suppressed, you can live a better quality of life, right? Um, and so the, the ultimate goal is to get people virally suppressed. So throughout the country, for the past few years now, we've been doing these, these graphs, these HIV care continuum graphs. And so the first part of it is always, you know, the estimated uh, number of people living with HIV. 86% were actually diagnosed, meaning they got tested. 86% of people know their status. Um, and this is, this is for LA, this is specific to LA. Every uh, jurisdiction has their own care continuum. So uh, in terms of, you see how there's a drop off at every level here? So 86% know their status, but only 60 something percent are engaged in care, meaning that they went to the doctor. And then when we go even further, it goes down more. Retained in care usually means that they've, they've been in care, I think, twice a year, once or twice a year, something like that. Once every six months? Yeah. Once a year now. Now it's once a year. And I thought now it was once a year. Okay. Um, yeah, so it just goes down. So people might get into care, but do they stay in care? Not, you know, there are a lot of reasons why people might not stay in care, and those are things for us as providers to consider 
and try to maintain that, that people stay in care. And then ultimately, uh, viral suppression is, is what's achieved, ideally. And so this, this one actually breaks it down according to age. So the first one is really light, hard to see, but that represents people 18 to 29. The middle blue one is 30 to 49, and then the green one here is people over 50. So when we look at the viral suppression rate, we see that 55% of older adults living with HIV, meaning people greater than or equal to age 50, um, are, have viral suppression, which is better than the other groups. You see it's higher than, than the younger groups. So, you know, usually when we do HIV and aging trainings, um, it's a lot of like gloom and doom, like this happens and this is really horrible and this is terrible, but this is a good thing to see that people are achieving viral suppression. So we should consider that and, and the reasons why that is. Does that mean older adults are better at taking their medications? What do you think? Yeah? Okay. Some people argue that b both ways. I've heard people say both. Maybe older adults might be more used to taking other medications, so they might take those as well a little bit better. That's why the viral suppression rates are higher. Could be. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Why? Because programming really targets younger people more. Well, I think the way the HIV care continuum is going now is younger, younger adults are doing riskier things and don't want to get tested. Yeah. Huh. Just the opposite should be happening. I think people that are older, at least people over 40 are just used to getting their HIV test a lot, especially if they're at risk. Mm. Okay, and I wonder how, how PrEP might fit into that, but let me we'll come back to that, Jeff. Well, a lot of it's experiential because people who lived through the worst days of the epidemic realize the consequences of not taking their meds. Mm -hmm. They're a lot more adherent than people who never saw them. Right, right. Many people have experienced, you know, being very sick and might, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, you found that typically when a person is diagnosed, they're diagnosed with AIDS alongside HIV. It's, it's one of the situations where I have to take my medication before I will die. Mm -hmm. As opposed to some of these younger might be HIV positive and you wouldn't take that risk. Willing to take that risk maybe because of feeling invincible for some reason or why why would or they be willing to take that? Active in their lives. Um, I mean, part, but I think someone in their twenties or thirties is just involved in life to the extent that they don't necessarily see around them among their peers mm -hmm. the consequences of not mm -hmm. being adherent to medication and not going to the doctor. Healthier overall. Right. Okay. Yeah, that that's interesting. Um, also, I think I don't know. Some this conversation just reminds me of a lot of the conversations we were having early on with um, people as far as testing, where older adults, specifically, actually, gay white men, most likely, were are most of the time. We're saying, like, when we were in our trainings, we're saying, you know. Um, it's no big deal, like, you know, if I get HIV, because I know Steve and whoever, they, they have it, and, you know, it takes 10 years for this thing to kind of kick in or whatever, so, you know, it's fine, I'm 70, so I've lived my life kind of thing. What do you say to people that say things like that to you? Because in the beginning, we were really shocked. We didn't expect that. We thought, you know, the perceived severity of the disease would be high, but people were saying, no big deal. others being affected by it and actually seeing it, it doesn't affect you because you don't foresee death, you don't foresee the problems that go along with it. So it's like mm -hmm. an invincible mm. feeling about it. Yeah. Until it actually hits home and then it's like, oh God, what do I do? You know, yeah. Yeah. Kind of and then also maybe the, the epidemic has changed over time, right, where people are you know, living longer, healthier lives, and where we're looking at HIV as a chronic disease now, much like other diseases, yeah, you know, well this is same. part of the conversation. Uh huh. Yeah, exactly. I just take a pill, I'll be okay, right? Without thinking of some of those co-occurring illnesses that might change the quality of life and make things more difficult, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there are a lot of difficult conversations when it comes to talking about testing and just all, all of this. So these are things to consider moving forward for those especially that are anticipating working with older adults and, and for those that currently are. Um, all right, so in terms of race, people living with HIV over 50 in LA, 59% of white people living with HIV are 50, over 50, 45% of a black African American 
are over 50. 38% of Latino Hispanic people living with HIV are over 50. And then lastly, 30% of Native American Alaska Natives uh, are over 50. So that just shows, according to race, within each group. Um, does, that, does this statistic make sense? Or is it a little weird? When I read it at first, I was like, this doesn't add to 100. What do, what do you mean? But this is within each group. So more than half of white people that are living with HIV are, are over 50. Are right? There, this is all that was in. That was actually in that handout. So I took that information from there. I didn't see any information about API, but probably could find it in the surveillance data, I'm sure. I thought the data was, was pretty standard here. So I think, I think it might be available. Um, yeah, so actually the source for that is here. So if you want to go and look at that from the comprehensive plan, you can find it there too. Um, so when we look at, uh, according to sex, about it, male, female was about, about the same, about half male, half female. Uh, we look specifically at trans folks. 28% uh, of transgender people living with HIV are over 50, 62% over 40. Uh, okay, so then we were talking about <coughs> concurrent diagnosis earlier. When we talk about stage three HIV, that's referring to having an AIDS diagnosis. So older people represent a disproportionate number of people living with, with uh, AIDS in Los Angeles County. 56% of people living with HIV in the county have an AIDS diagnosis, but 69% of them are over age 50, right? So we're just really hammering this point in. I think you get it, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so we talked about this. People, you know, the conversation isn't being had. A lot of you know, providers will either be uncomfortable or just not bring it up. And so we have to really kind of examine our own biases as to why that's happening and, and move forward knowing that. And you know, this is another thing. Like when we started doing this work, uh, we, were training other, uh, we were training aging providers to go into senior centers and to talk about this stuff. That's what we, we were doing, a training of trainers program at that time. Um, and there was one trainer that, you know, she went through our training and it went really well and she went out into the field with one of our trainers together, the two of them. And when she got there to the training, our other trainer reported back to us that she was uncomfortable saying vagina. She was uncomfortable saying penis, saying the words that you need to say in order to talk about sex. But she would say, you know, when they did that thing that, that Adam and Eve did, you know, that thing that they, and it's like there's so many things going on there. But also <laughs> it was just very, uh, she was very uncomfortable having that conversation. So if you know that you're just not capable, like you're really just not, that's not for you, then maybe it's really not for you. Maybe you should re be referring that person to someone else. Because if you show up to somebody and have a conversation like that, you're going to make them very, very uncomfortable mm -hmm. and very unwilling to talk to you. So you know, you're really doing a disservice to everybody in that case. So, you know, it's better to refer them to somebody else if you're unable to do it. But if you are, it's worth examining our biases and why we don't bring things up when we should. Um, okay, so older adults are not perceived as being at risk, which we talked about in great detail. Older adults may also not perceive themselves to be at risk, which is a little bit different, right? I'm not at risk. I'm not, that's for young people. That's for those types of people that do those types of things. Um, you know, th this idea that I'm just not at risk, it, it really, um, persists within this group. Okay, so there was a study called the National Social Life Health and Aging Project. This happened at the University of Chicago some years back and it examined uh, sex over 50 and what um, things looked like. So study methods, there were over 3,000 people in this study, so it was really big. Um, so reported the prevalence of sexual activities and behaviors among people between the ages of 57 to 85. So it was a really good study. If you have the time to check it out, go ahead. But I'll just share a little bit of what came from that. But before we do that, we have a question. So according to the study, 50% of people between ages of 57 to 64 reported being sexually active. So half of people in their mid-50s to mid-60s reported being sexually active. True or false? Does that sound right? True, most people said true. Okay, so the 21% wins this time because that's false because it was actually much higher than that. It was 73%, not just 50%. So people are reporting having sex in their 50s, 60s, and beyond. I mean, look at this. We've got folks mid-60s to mid-70s, over half there. 
Of course not, yeah. <laughs> what, no way, of course they don't. That would be crazy. <laughs> and then 75 to 85, you know, a quarter, over a quarter of folks 75 to 85 are reporting having sex. So why is it that we just assume people are not? Why is that? Because they don't? Because they're old, because they're old, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I guess that's the reason why. But this is the truth. I mean, this is what that study found. So we know we know that's the case. I'm curious. Yeah. Um, when was this study done? Um, it was 2005 <coughs> to 2006. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah. And actually, in that ROA study, that the, idea, the um, erectile dysfunction drugs came up because we were saying, you know, does that have an impact on the HIV prevalence among people over 50? Because when you, um, you know, are able to use that, that means that you're able to have sex more often, right? And then more enjoyable sex more often. Um, but it also means that you're more able to use a condom too, which is something interesting that you know we thought from the study as well. But basically, the, the study from ROA found that people that were using erectile dysfunction drugs were having more sex, like more often, but were not having more unsafe sex. So that was a, a good thing that, that we saw from that study back then. Because we kind of thought, like, is this a, a good thing or not? Because you know people get the drugs, but they don't get condoms that come along with it, or they maybe not on PrEP. Or something, PrEP came up earlier when we, I forgot what the comment was that you made that brought, oh, because younger people were maybe not being tested or engaging in more risky behaviors. Are, is everyone here familiar with PrEP? Pre-exposure prophylaxis? Okay, I see people <coughs> nodding then. But so usually when we talk about PrEP, it's not about older adults, right? We don't usually include older adults in that conversation, but maybe we should start doing that too because every, every prevention option should be on the table when we're talking about risk behaviors and no one should be excluded. Women are often excluded, many groups are often excluded. So um, those are things to think about too. Um, so although sexual, uh, sexuality has long been thought to deteriorate inevitably with age, um, we found that health is more important indicator. So usually when we talk about older adults, it's always like 50 plus, or you just use a chronological age as a marker, right? But somebody in their 50, you know, somebody 52 could be less healthy than somebody 62 if their behavior is totally different. It depends on your lifestyle, right? So it's not just about chronological age, it's about your overall health status and encouraging healthy behaviors. Um, and people that feel healthier and are healthier tend to have more sex. That's just, you know, part of healthy aging. So um, there's that. And then this suggests that older adults with medical problems considering treatment might affect sexuality, uh, might, uh, might uh, cause issues with having difficulty having sex. And then uh, they should be counseled on that rather than just their age. So we should consider that. Um, the frequency of sex two times per month in the past 12 months. 63% uh, of women reported having sex two times per month, more than two times per month, and 65% of men in that study. Remember, ages 57, what was it, 57 to uh, 85, 57 to 85. So that's, yeah, I guess we don't think that, typically. So older prevention messages usually don't have older faces, uh, prevention messages usually don't have older adult faces. We don't see gray hair, we don't see wrinkles, but we should, looking at what the epidemic looks like. Um, okay. So the immune system function declines as we age, whether with HIV or not. So this is also something to think about. There's a long term called immunosenescence um, that just really refers to the decline of the immune system as we age. And that's not specific to HIV. That's just, as we get older, things tend to just change and break down, right? That's just kind of what happens. But you know, our lifestyle can, can help to influence that. Um, oftentimes, signs and symptoms of HIV might be con confused with other, uh, other signs of aging. So, you know, am I feeling tired or feeling fatigued because I'm getting older? Or is it because I'm an acute infection? Do I need to, HIV infection, do I need to go get tested? You know, usually won't, people won't say, I'm feeling tired, it must be HIV, you know? So it's kind of confusing that, you know, you might feel flu-like symptoms because there's, you know, the flu going on or if you should get tested. So sometimes they're confusing. And so it's really important that we just say, get tested, because that's the only way you're going to know. It's not, you know, that, that's it. We shouldn't wait for signs and symptoms with, with HIV. All right. We're going to take a break in a couple of seconds, but I just want to get through the last few here. So older women tend to be at less risk for HIV than younger women. True or false? Older women tend to be at less risk. <coughs> I'm going to 
close it down. Three, two, one. <coughs> false. Most people said false. Okay, and that was right. So older women can be at greater risk than younger women um, a lot of times, and that's for a number of reasons. So you know, we might have postmenopausal women that say, "I used to, you know, I used to use condoms at some point because I was concerned about pregnancy." Right now, I'm no longer concerned about pregnancy, so I can be free. I could, you know, like I don't have to worry about it, kind of thing. Um, and then also, uh, well, before I get to that, so there's according to that study that I was just showing you, only 38% of men and 22% of women reported having discussed sex with a physician over 50 uh, since they turned 50. Um, you know, this is a, a huge issue. But specifically about women, there's the issue about uh, condom usage and then also changes in vaginal lubrication uh, that might uh, make women more susceptible to cuts, abrasions, um, making it more painful to have sex, but also at making older women more at risk for STIs and HIV. So that's something to consider. You know, if you've got that going on, also less likely to use a condom, those things don't work very well together. Um, there are no treatment guidelines for older adults. Uh, there have been some recommendations made between ACREA, the American Geriatric Society, and the American Academy of HIV Medicine. Fourteen experts came together and tried to create some treatment guidelines which exist, but are they followed? Not, not really. It's just a suggestion, really. Um, so there aren't treatment guidelines for older adults. Perhaps there should be. Um, New York State and other, a few other states have kind of a, a blueprint to end AIDS, getting to zero in San Francisco. Is there one in Los Angeles? Yeah? What is it called? Um, you know, the, the Department of Public Health just revised it. I don't remember. And it's not getting zero. It's, um, our goal is to get, um, I think it's 70% um, reduction in okay. emissions. Okay. So. You know, we've got to have everybody on treatment and we're just not there. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so many states have been coming up with their plan to get to the end of AIDS, right? Or to get to fewer, 70% reduction. Um, and so a lot of those plans usually typically include these kind of things, which I'm assuming LA's plan probably does too, or something like it, uh, where you get people tested, make sure that they're retained in treatment, and that they have access to PEP and PrEP. So PrEP, uh, which most of you, I think, were familiar with, is a medication that you can take daily uh, that is highly effective, can be 90-something percent effective if it's taken every day to prevent HIV. Um, so there's that, and then NPEP, which is post-exposure prophylaxis that's um, non-occupational. So if somebody has been exposed within, I think, 72 hours, if you're taking these medications for 30 days, I believe it is, 28 days, okay, yeah, then um, that, that too can help to prevent HIV. So making sure that people have access to those things uh, in order to get to zero. So San Francisco has a similar one, getting people in treatment, tested, and immediately prep, same kind of thing. Um, all right, so these are some of those checklists that I was showing you. This is our age, one of our ages, not a condom. This is from two years ago. Anna, who's uh, this woman here, she was one of our pro uh, program participants. She was in our training, and so now she's, she prints this out everywhere she goes, and it's like all over the US. We just saw her in Baltimore a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you can see all of our campaign stuff online, and feel free to, um, to print it out, and we're happy to co-brand too, if you want to put your, your um, logo on it as well, if it's useful for you to distribute where you are. There's that. So I think this is the last slide here before our break. So 2008, the AIDS Institute based in Tampa, they, uh, at USCA during that year, they defined September 18th as HIV and Aging Awareness Day. Did you guys know there is an Awareness Day? Okay, some people knew, some people didn't. So September 18th, we have plenty of time before that. Lots of events happen like during that week. Um, this year, the US Conference on AIDS is happening at that time. Uh, and so there will be a lot of events there around long-term survivors, around HIV and aging. Uh, so if you're interested in doing something like that here in LA, there's plenty of time to plan for that. So consider that as well. I thought maybe it would be a good idea to begin with uh, doing these case studies or doing, doing at least one case study. So each of you should have a little packet that's stapled in front of you and it starts with Marvin. Uh, I would just, each group, if you can just work on it together, each table, work on it uh, with your table. Um, basically choose one, choose one of the case studies, there are six of them in there, whichever one you choose. And then there are a few questions here that I want you to consider. So the presentation we're about to get into is about multimorbidity and managing lots of things at the same time, right? And so when we do that, I want you to, to read and consider your case first, whichever one you choose as a group. Um, 
what challenges exist for that person that you're, you will be working with, what opportunities exist, what type of questions you might ask, and then what type of resources you'd provide. So you're the provider working with that <coughs> client. So it could be in uh, multiple different capacities. I imagine everybody has a different role in their work. So think about it from your, your work's perspective and try to be the best uh, service provider that you can be for that person. So let's take a few minutes to do that. I think, uh, so the idea here is what we're going to talk about is just managing multiple issues and what to do with that moving forward. So that's a lot of what the next presentation is going to be about. So I just kind of wanted to get the, the juices flowing, I guess, about that whole idea uh, with these case studies. And so these, uh, these case studies are actually based on real stories. These are part of our community. Are you guys familiar with Community Promise? It's one of the Debbie's. It, it stands for Peers Reaching Out Modeling Intervention Strategies. It's one of the CDC evidence-based interventions. Uh, so we did it with older adults years ago, and it had, I mean, maybe like five years ago, and it had never been, none of the evidence-based interventions had been done with older adults before. So it was great. We had folks that were um, HIV positive and at risk uh, for HIV distributing these stories. These are called role model stories because at the end of, I cut off, I edited these for the purpose of this, like just a little bit, but normally the actual story has the end of it, which is, you know, I was engaged in this risky behavior, I am no longer doing that because of XYZ, and the idea is to encourage other people to, to um, eliminate those kind of unhealthy uh, behavior choices and make better health choices, basically. Um, and so that's where these are based from. So these are not just made up stories. These are actually real stories of real people. Only the names are changed. Um, so yeah, with that in mind, uh, I guess let's see. I know a few groups chose Marvin. Who chose Marvin? One, two, three, three groups. Okay, all right. Um, so let's start with Marvin and let's kind of go through some of these things. I wonder if you all came up with, a, you know, with different things or the same things. Um, so. I guess we can, we can uh, through all three of you, we'll just, anybody within those groups answer. Uh, what kind of challenges did you guys, did you see with him? And most importantly, what kind of questions did you think were necessary to ask, considering the issues that Marvin was facing? And Marvin's the first one, for those of you that want to follow along with uh, who Marvin is and what his issues might be. Is everybody shy? Well, Marvin, so, so what kind of issues, what challenges, and then uh, questions? Marvin. About his at-risk behavior? Okay. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Because she was a church going lady, there was yeah. no risk. Okay, <laughs> all right, go ahead, go ahead, okay. Um, that you just reminded me of something that happened in DC years ago with one of our trainings. One guy told us that um, it's, not pos it's not possible to get HIV from a woman because fluids don't flow upstream. <laughs> so you just reminded me of that. <laughs> it happened, that's a real, that was a real, tra that was a real life thing. <laughs> Okay. What else about Marvin? <laughs> so you might ask him about what supports or supports he has in his life. What what kind of questions would you guys have asked if you were talking to Marvin? Marvin's in front of you. What would you what would you want to know outside of what support systems he has in order to provide good services to him? Involving him in, in, in the what happens later, or what what you're offering is is most important, and asking those kind of open ended questions. Yeah, it sounds like a lack of knowledge there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any resources you would provide him? You said uh, bisexual literature. Is there a lot of, are there a lot of resources? Um, okay, did anybody choose Octavio? All right, so what kind of questions would you ask Octavio considering what's going on with him? Um, any resources? Online support groups, yeah, that can be helpful. Are there any support groups locally for, for people over 50 living with HIV? There are that are, are they led by clinicians or there are they social support groups or both? Okay, that's great because in a lot of places there aren't. It's good to know that that, that exists here. Um, okay, there was one. Um, Tamara, I think a, a couple chose Tamara, right? You you guys did? Did you guys too? No, you did too. Okay, all right. So what did you guys come up with with the challenges that Tamara is facing and? what to do and what questions to ask. For you guys, what, do, what kind of questions do you, did you come up with? What would you want to ask her in order to get more information and to provide good services to her or a good response to her? Okay, examining her belief system. In this case, she, she had a hard time uh, adhering to HIV medications. And I can't remember if this one was one that was because of um, how she was raised. She didn't believe in taking those medications. I don't know, some, sometimes 
sometimes that's part of the issue. I know that we, when we were developing these stories, that topic came up quite a bit where people were saying, um, you know, I just don't adhere to the Western medicine thing, you know. I do herbal supplements and that kind of thing, and that's, you know, that's what works for me. So that's another issue that has come up quite a bit that we've had challenges with, and, you know, how do you, um, you know, not discount that, but at the same time provide other resources and how to, you know, how do you work with that? And it can be really, really challenging. Um, we've seen some really negative things come from, come from that, um, including with someone we used to work with um, who passed away, actually, as a result of some of those kind of challenges and not, you know, so it's, it can be very, very, very difficult. So, um, all right, so I want to <coughs> move into the rest of the presentation, so we don't have that much time left. So let me do that. So thank you for participating in that. <coughs> 